Hi, this is Hospital Bharti and welcome to a brand new episode of Let's Talk. And today we have with us Andrew Vakani, Principal Engineer at Caring Group. Andrew, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, good to be here as well. Yeah, and today we are talking to talk about uh, stateful workloads, uh, whether one should run database in Kubernetes or not. How would you define state for workload? Primarily for me, uh, a persistent or a stateful workload is something we've got an application uh, that has, a, as unfortunately, it's a state of memory. Uh, if that application needs to be, say, um, shut down, you know, forgetting about Kubernetes completely here, but if that application needs to be shut down, typically the application will be writing to disk. Uh, when the application comes back up, it will read from disk and it will try and recover into the same state that the application was in before. Uh, so I think the, the key takeaway is any application that's right to persistent disk in, in this context. Let's talk a bit about the the beginnings of Kubernetes. It was stateless, uh, but now folks are running a lot of stateful workloads on Kubernetes. Uh, you folks have been around for a while. Uh, you have seen both sides of the aisle, you know. So talk a bit about how you have seen this, you know, of course, with every technology, folks do try to bring a lot of a lot of kind of use cases which were not designed for that specific technology. Linux is a very good example. Uh, sometimes we are right, sometimes we are wrong. But let's talk about how the you know state full workload start making their way into Kubernetes, and what are the arguments that hey you should do that or not do that? Back in the days, uh, early Kubernetes, right? We had a, a, a resource available to us called Petsets. So Petsets uh, uh, was almost um, a, a demanding term for. Workloads that the, the developers of Kubernetes thought that perhaps particularly weren't well suited for it. Um, the pet sets have evolved into something called stateful sets now, which are very kind of mature. They've been TA to think in like 1.6 Kubernetes, so they're very well known. Uh, but essentially what a stateful set and the difference between a stateful set and a say, deployment or a job in Kubernetes is the fact that we're attaching the, uh, persistent disk to each of the uh, replicas inside the, the uh, stateful set. So it means that we've got, uh, it might be a, a Kafka cluster, for example, that might have eight brokers, and each of the eight brokers are going to have uh, their own persistent disk. And importantly, whenever Kubernetes comes along and, and does its job and tries to migrate or schedule the workload, that persistent disk will follow um, uh, the, the replica around. So whenever, say, broker six in this Kafka, uh, uh, this Kafka cluster comes up, it will have the log file and the information that it expects being attached to it. Can you talk about what are the general discussions that you are hearing or you hear, whether it could be your internal team when you are like looking at a specific customer use case or you know in the ecosystem in general, where once again it's like, hey, should we run you know stateful workloads on Kubernetes or not? Yes, um, and it's, it's a constant conversation inside Carrick. Um, I, I think it can be summed up by, um, you know, if, if there's a managed service available for your stateful workload, so for example, a SQL database, at Kayak, we would typically recommend that the cluster go and leverages the managed service, right? So this isn't even just about uh, you know having to manage it yourself. It's the fact that you've got people like Amazon, like Google, that are investing hundreds, thousands of engineers of ours into making the managed service more you know um, available, performant, and everything else. So we don't believe that somebody know our customers, what's going to bring the value to, or even have the engineering kind of uh, capabilities to go and make the, the same investment. So there are some kind of um, no-brainers, if you like, that uh, uh, SQL is one of them. Now, we don't live in the world where everything that is data or stateful is in a SQL database. Um, and it's kind of in a little bit of a lull now, but uh, two, two, three years ago, and a car engaged when I was working with a colleague where it was blockchain. Uh, and there was no managed service for the type of blockchain. We, there are managed services for blockchains, but not for the specific private blockchain that we were using. Uh, and we made a decision that we thought that it would work well uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, so that was one that was one decision that was backed uh, at Carg we worked with, uh, kind of not for customers. Uh, that was backed with us, and we kind of um, we uh, wrote an operator uh, that we we'll probably talk about in a little bit. But that operator. Um, you know, have the business logic and everything that we needed to do to run the, the blockchain application on a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and saying that, I, I, even when I started using Kubernetes about 2017, um, my first uh, kind of uh, um, uh, challenge to running or, or my first workload running in Kubernetes was a stateful workload. So I've been one of these guys that have been constantly uh, since you know, 2007 
uh, you know, going kind of against the common knowledge that, you know, the um, uh, Kelsey Hightower tweets, you know, about, uh, you know, run anything in Kubernetes apart from, you know, maybe stateful workloads or databases. Uh, I, I've, I've kind of been doing that from the beginning anyway. I, I do understand, um, um, you know, not only, you know, Kubernetes itself, there's still a little bit of a, um, um, a thought that it's it's hard to get the grips with, hard to control operations wide. I and mean, then you can see that obviously people struggle with that. We've always, we've always had this struggle with a database that hasn't performed well. Are you crazy thinking we're going to put it into Kubernetes? And I think in that case, you know, we're, we're with the customer. It's not something that we should be doing. Can we just go into a specific or maybe some use cases or, you know, specific, you know, once again, workloads where you're like, hey, no, we should not be running stateful workloads in Kubernetes. Uh, we've touched on it there. I think if there's something that is like mission critical, if it's a production, if it's your kind of um, uh, really your bread and butter, uh, I, we, we would definitely suggest if it's SQL, uh, be looking at a, at a managed service up, um, if it's available. Obviously, this gets complicated whenever you're running Kubernetes on premise. You don't actually have sometimes the, the ability to even connect out to the managed service. In that case, we would be saying, look, you probably are an enterprise. You might have something like a database hotel. You've got a team of people that are running databases in your enterprise. Why not go to them as a customer and ask them to provision you with the database on site there? So if you've got those operations, if you've got those kind of capabilities available to you as an enterprise, then we would recommend that that you take and, and, and leverage them. When you look at some of these modern technologies, they kind of come into existence to solve a specific problem, but as the user base grows, uh, you know, suddenly we start seeing a lot of use cases that we did not even envision in the very beginning. Uh, what what kind of major trends that you're seeing in the Kubernetes space when it comes to stateful workloads or databases, where you're like, hey, this is kind of becoming a new norm there? Yeah, um, definitely the amount of customers, and you can see even from the Twitter traffic, um, um, you know, there are proper enterprises being built on running cloud native on Kubernetes at the minute. Um, I, I, you know, I'm a bit fast. I've worked with Kafka for a long time, so I think Confluent are a good example of this, right? You know, the value-added com uh, company for, for for Kafka, they, as part of their enterprise suite, they have a Kubernetes operator, um, you know, which will handle all of the log rotation and scaling and all of the stuff that a Kubernetes API is not going to be able to do for you. Um, and that you know, business logic needs to be encapsulated into. Um, an, an operator and that that operator even that that's another good point that operator framework as well is much more mature and um, you know it seems like uh, whether it's an actual database mysql whether it's kafka uh, and the, the couch dbs for example they've all got operators now which will allow you to um confidently run these databases inside uh, a kubernetes cluster as in organization because kubernetes you know we are we have started to see a lot of things in production now as organizations they do look at you know running their stateful workloads or, you know databases in kubernetes what advice you have for them what is the right approach for stateful workloads on kubernetes yes um so here's the cop out from my perspective there's no right or wrong answer here unfortunately what i would say is that running a stateful workload inside kubernetes is not fundamentally wrong it might be quite hard um, but I think the point is, if you're running it on, say, a suite of VMs that have, you know, MIGs in front of them or whatever your infrastructure might be, you're going to encompass the same challenges as you do in Kubernetes. Um, now, Kubernetes has made, uh, uh, it's a very kind of rapid roadmap, and there seems to be more and more capabilities um, with Kubernetes that allow you to treat. It goes a little bit against kind of the mantra or the ethos, I think, of Kubernetes that you do have to put a little bit of control or you need additional YAML, additional guardrails, if you like, on this workload. Uh, it goes back to the cats versus uh, cattle kind of situation that we've got, um, um, you know, back in kind of 2000, kind of uh, uh, 2018 kind of time. You know, that you've got, um, you've got to really kind of uh, keep an eye on and manage and you've got to kind of uh, work with them differently to either stateful workload that you're on with Kubernetes, for example. When it comes to running uh, stateful workloads or you know databases on Kubernetes, there is already a complexity with there, and then you're also moving your database there. 
the reality is that we are not going to reduce this complexity. What is going to happen is help customers deal with this complexity. Talk a bit about how Carry Group is helping or how you see customers are looking at, because they should not be wasting too much, too much of their time in, in managing Kubernetes and all those clusters. They should be focused, their developers should be focusing on writing business applications. That's a great point. And it's exactly one of the reasons why I think that this, these days we shouldn't be afraid of running it inside Kubernetes. To take this the other way, actually, in fact, if you can imagine you've got you know eighty percent of your workload as an organization that has now been migrated over the past three four years, you know app modernization has been moved to Kubernetes and containerized and whatnot, you know why then go and suggest that you have to go and learn another tool chain, another suite like Ansible, Chef, whatever it is, to go and manage a suite of VMs to run the database on, um, so if, even even from a level below the developers, even the operators of this. Um, um, by not having the database of the stateful workload in Kubernetes, you're effectively mandating that there's a whole other tool chain, there's a whole other run book and everything else that an operations team who are already under pressure need to go and, and, and look at. And it does feed into topics that you're going to cover like observability, like logging and everything else. You have to run a separate essentially stack. You might need to run a separate you know, class um, to look at that um, database or proxy and whatever it might be compared to say your front end or your microservices or the rest of your workload. Andrew, thank you so much for taking time out today and talk about this topic. And as usual, I would love to sit down with you again and discuss the topic. Thank you. Thank you so much.